Okay, okay. Sorry to be starting a little bit late, but uh, maybe the best thing to do, since we all need a memory jog here, is to start off by reading these uh, eight verses. And so I'm going to ask Matthias, if he would, just to read Matthew 16, 21 through 28. Mm -hmm. And read 21. From that time on, on Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never was, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their lives for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? Or what, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For, for the Son of Man is going to, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward the person according to what they have done. To their training. Some who are standing here will not test them, so they see the sound of my time. Okay, to put this in its context, recall from last week that Jesus is, is in a, a, this kind of section of the book. He does a lot of withdrawing, kind of getting away from the crowds. And to do that, a lot of times, he gets kind of outside the Jewish territory. So he's gone to Caesarea Philippi. Sing some geography question. Where is Caesarea Philippi? Do you remember from last week where it is? Uh, northern part, is a northern part of uh, Israel, Palestine. Yeah, it's it's up in the source waters of the Jordan River, north, as you said, north of the, the Sea of Galilee. And so this has been his Galilean ministry, but now he's kind of withdrawn to the north, and it's it's really kind of in a pagan area. And so they've withdrawn, they're off by themselves. And so Jesus poses this great question, who do people say I am? And so they have this mountaintop moment. They, you know, they give all these theories and they say, well, what about you? And, and Peter says, you are Messiah, the son of the living God. Oh, great. Finally, we have this breakthrough. And they realize that not only is he Messiah, but he's also divine. So this, this is, you know, just kind of this warm feeling, you know. And then Jesus pours cold water on the whole thing. By starting at verse 21, it says, from that time on. And, and last week, you may or may not remember, I, I drew a picture of kind of a kind of a fulcrum, kind of a seesaw on the board. And I said, this, this is a turning point in the book. This is the turning point in the book. The, the first part of the book is, is all about Jesus proclaims the kingdom. The, 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 which kingdom are we talking about? The kingdom what? What kind of kingdom is it? Kingdom of God. Kingdom of God, but in Matthew, we don't call it the kingdom of God except every about three times. The rest of the time in Matthew, it's called... Kingdom of heaven. What? Kingdom of heaven. Right. And, and so we, we think these things are equivalent, but Matthew is more sensitive to a Jewish audience... They don't use the word God very much. We, we, we've got to give them credit on it. So call it kingdom. So Jesus proclaims the kingdom. That's uh, until we get to 1621. And, and then th this next section is about Jesus headed for the cross. Jesus and the cross. It's about his atonement. So we see Jesus as a teacher and Jesus as an atoning sacrifice. Okay, so this this is uh, we're, we're shifting gears here, if, if I can call it that. And, and so, uh, so Jesus starts making all these predictions about bad things are going to happen. Suffer many things at the hands of religious political leaders. And then he'd be killed on, and on the third day raised to life. 
You've got to love Peter here. The thing that Peter does is so like Peter because he does the things that everybody else wants to do, but they're kind of inhibited, but Peter's not inhibited. You know, we, we, yeah, he's kind of the person that has no filter. You know, he, he just says what he's thinking. He does what he's thinking. So he takes Jesus aside and he says, don't be so negative. We're not going to let these things happen to you. What? We're going to, we're going to take care of you. You're going to be, the kingdom is, you've been talking about the kingdom. Why are you beginning to be so discouraged and such a defeatist? And so, we're not going to let this happen. Boy, Jesus really flares back at him. Instead of saying very patiently, very Christ-like, say, you know, but Peter, you just don't understand. Let me explain it to you again. Instead, what does he say? Jesus turned and said to Peter in verse 23. What does he say here? He calls him Satan. He says, you are a channel of temptation. Satan is speaking through you. I see your mouth moving. I hear Satan's voice. Wow! What a thing to say. And then verse 24, he starts talking about all this thing about carrying a cross and self-denial and so forth. So what I've said here, this is kind of my way of, I mean, this, this is not, you know, they're not three official doctrines here. But as we look at our contemporary culture, and I'm going to have to say to a certain extent, contemporary Christian culture, there are three doctrines that are key in the gospel that we don't like to talk about very much. We kind of, we kind of pull back from it a little bit. And, and the first one is, he says, uh, is, is the necessity of salvation. This necessity of salvation. In other words, we're going to have to have a sacrifice. We're going to have to have the Messiah on the cross to save us from our sins. What Christianity has to offer you is not a better life, okay? The, the whole idea of Christianity is not to make this life better. Newsflash. So many people today are, are, are preaching that gospel and attracting people because it's supposed to make this life better. No, what Christianity has to offer you is life, L-I-F-E, period. It's not a choice between the life you've got and a better life. It's a choice between life and, and, and death. That's, that's the choice that Jesus offers. And, and we call that, we call that being safe for our sins, we call that salvation. It used to be that salvation was a word we used constantly at church. We sang about it, we preached about it, we taught about it, we prayed about it. Not so much anymore. You can't sell salvation. Everybody pretty much assumes that they're okay anyway, and we're just looking for a way for God to support our life and the things that we're doing and help us, you know, uh, actualize our own ambitions. Quite the, obvious, quite the obvious of that is Jesus here talks about daily denial and submission. Okay? And so we live in a very autonomous society where the individual is, you know, you've got to find your own truth. You've got to be authentic and real to yourself, real to your own whatever you want to do. And we don't want to impede or impinge on anybody else's uh, ideas of what they want to do. It's, it's all about the individual. And Jesus said, <clears throat> take up your cross daily and follow me. You follow him, you go where he's going, not where you want to go. And so this, this self-denial is, uh, is, is an art that uh, it, it's easy to lose the practice of. He says you have to do it every day. And then finally, he says, uh, <clears throat> he says uh, this, is, this is a hard one here, if you just begin to think about it. Verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with, with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Uh, of course, <clears throat> to make this politically correct, we have to edit this a little bit. We have to say, who roared each person according to what 
he or she has done, or to what they have done, to say what he has done, of course, is... Anyway, you get the picture. But this, this, this doctrine here is in the Bible, and it's strong in the Gospels. And that is a performance-based, we would say, judgment, or another way to say it is evaluation. Now, you, you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Performance-based judgment, he's going to reward everybody according to what they have done. What about this idea? What about this idea, like Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that says, we're saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. For we are God's workmanship, and so forth and so on. What about that? What about that idea? Where, what happened to grace? It's like, uh, Jesus, you know, I get this self-denial. I get the importance of bearing my cross and following you. But you say you're going to come back and reward every person according to what they've done? Now, at this point, usually the Bible class teacher uh, explains all that. I pose the question. Explain. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave that for you to struggle with a little bit. Because this idea comes up again and again in Jesus' teaching. There's somebody's given something. They're given some sort of responsibility. And then there's a period of performance where they're kind of left on their own to figure out what to do. And then there's a period of evaluation. Now, he didn't tell these stories over and over again just, you know, just to pass the time. There's a message here that we need to pick up on, and I'm not sure exactly uh, you know, everything we're supposed to get, get from it. At any rate, <clears throat> uh, let's move on to a section, Matthew 17, if you've got a way to, to read along. And I'll just read this section for you. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Okay. Now, if you have ever been a supervisor in the workplace, or if you have ever been a parent, you realize that this, this raises a question, what about the other nine guys, okay? Jesus is taking these three guys, one of whom just caught it in his pants. I mean, just, he just got flamed by Jesus for saying what he did. But, you know, these three guys, they get to go up on the mountain while the other nine are down there, you know, trying to do their thing. What's happening here? Why do we have just three? Why do they get chosen? What did they do to get at the top of the, the, the list there? Uh... Alyssa, can I ask you that question? Uh, you can, but not sure. Yeah. Well, uh, anybody else want to, to hazard a guess on that? Why these three? Has, has he done this before? Will he do this again? What's, what's going on here? What do these guys have in common? Or what do they have in common with Jesus? Okay, so here's a very important concept, a very important word that Alvinzo just brought up, and that's the word disciple. That's the word disciple, and uh, it's funny. It's funny to me, maybe not anybody else, but it's funny to me that in the uh, in the Bible. This word is a noun. We find it useful to turn it into a verb as well nowadays. So we say we disciple people or somebody discipled me or Jesus is discipling these guys. But the, you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's supposed to be, there's supposed to be 12 disciples. In fact, there are a lot more disciples than that, but there are 12 special ones that he designated apostles. He designated apostles. Then what's the story about the inner circle? Peter, James, John. And I'd like to point out that in the Gospel of Matthew, we find Jesus taking these three aside. I think it's three times. I may have missed a time, but I think it's three times he takes them aside. Here's one. When they go on the Mount of Transfiguration. I don't really like that word. We'll get, get, to, we'll get to the word I like in a minute. When, when else does he do this? He takes these three aside. Ben, do you remember? Remember? 
Jim? Yeah, you would call my name. I always think of that. <laughs> okay, so, here it is. Yes. The, 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 the last time he's in the garden, when he goes to pray, they all go with him, and then he yes, takes these yes. three, evidently a little bit further into the garden. Then there's, there, there's transfiguration, and then there's one that we've already covered, and that is when he goes to raise uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead, uh, that he, he just takes these three into the room with him. You say, well, in that case, hey, that's easy. Houses were little back then. They wouldn't all fit in the room. I grant you that, probably. But these guys right here have something else in common. What do they have in common with each other? What are they doing when Jesus meets them the first time? Well, they're fishermen. What did you say? Fishermen. Yeah, these guys work as, they're, they're fishermen uh, out at the Sea of Galilee. And they're, they're, we would call them blue collar, working class people, peasants, if you will. They're, they're probably not broke. They may own their own business. And James and John had said they left their, their boats and nets with their father and the servants. So it's, it's what employed in their business. But they're from the same region as Jesus. He's from Nazareth. They're from Galilee. They're blue-collar people. And so th the idea here is that there is an inner circle, okay? And, and what, I want to, what I want to introduce here is that the idea is that we can't be close to everybody, okay? You, you can't have 156 best friends. There's a reason that Jesus chose only 12. And there's a reason that there were three, the inner circle. And then John likes to call himself what? He likes to Jesus. call himself what? He, he did, I love that he liked to call himself that, but on one occasion he refers to himself as the one Jesus loved. In fact, in the Gospel of John, there's more than one occasion. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. We see Peter an awful lot, the spotlights on him a lot. So I'd like to say that this is kind of an inner circle, but in the process of discipling people, we make disciples one at a time, one at a time. And so people that are come into our life that are special friends to us, certainly our own children, you know, we have an opportunity to be close to them in a special way, grandchildren, and, and make an impression on them. And so that's what we see Jesus doing here is going a little deeper with a few. Let me point out that outside the realm of the disciples, he had that kind of special relationship with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Uniquely personal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we don't see any women among the, the twelve. But where we do see women is at the cross. All these guys are hiding. Okay, maybe John's there. Okay, we've got to give John some credit. We, when we read in Luke chapter 8, you, you see, it turns out that Jesus had to eat also. So there had to be some money involved. Who, who provided the money for Jesus to travel around the country teaching and performing miracles? You know? It was women. Okay? It's all women. So there, there are some, some women involved. I think it's important in our discipling relationships to be absolute purity and for us, uh, especially those of us who are, who are married, this is something that has to be approached with, with great care, but they're part of the group. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, of course, are a family that he's very, very close to. And, and we run into them, particularly in, in the book of John. Okay, so these three are part of an inner circle. They go up on a mountain, high mountain, and it says, <clears throat> probably still up there around Caesarea Philippi, <clears throat> and there he was transfigured before them. Now, this word transfigured, I don't think we use it anywhere else in the Bible. And it, it really, I think the way it got into our English Bible is through a Latin translation. But if you look back at the Greek, the original language, the word here is metamorpho. And what does that suggest to you? What English word does that suggest? Metamorpho. Metamorphosis, which is the word that we use for a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It also, this is important, is the word that we read in Romans 12, and I think verse 2, that says, uh, Beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, present your body a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service of worship. 
be not conformed to this world, but be, we could say transfigured, but we say transformed, transformed be metamorphosed by the renewal of your minds. And also in, I think, 2 Corinthians 3, where it talks about we are constantly being transformed by beholding his likeness. So this is something that you and I go through too. But at any rate, <clears throat> radical change in Jesus, you know, glowing face shone like the sun. This sounds a little bit like John's vision in Revelation chapter 1. And just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> what's significant about these two guys? I mean, it could have been, you know, like Samuel and David, you know. There are a lot of heroes in the Old Testament. It could have been, you know, I don't know, maybe Noah and Solomon or somebody like that. I mean, what, what is it with Moses and Elijah? Jason, what, what's special about these guys? People say that Jesus was both of these people at some time or another. For sure, Elijah. He, he was identified strongly with Elijah. And, and so, one thing that's important, you see a couple of references there. In Malachi 4, which in, in our Bible is, is the last book of the Old Testament, God is speaking and he says, I'm going to send my messenger Elijah back before the Messiah comes, the great day Elijah's coming. So this was very deeply ingrained in the Jewish mind is that, that Elijah is going to be back to usher the Messiah in. Then in, in Deuteronomy 18, and I don't know if you spent much time on Deuteronomy. It's not in the top 40 of, you know, of, of Bible books that we like to read a lot. But the book of Deuteronomy is basically Moses' farewell address, Okay. So he reviews a lot of things that have happened, you know, since they left Egypt. He goes over a lot of the laws. But one thing he says in his farewell address, he says, God is going to send a prophet like me. He's going to send a prophet like me. Now, there are a lot of prophets that come in the Old Testament, but for Moses to say a prophet like me, that's a cut above. That's a cut above. You know, a lawgiver, a teacher, a leader. You know, it's, 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 you know, we've had a lot of presidents of the United States. We've only had one George Washington, only one Abraham Lincoln, okay? So if we get another one like that, that's pretty significant. So at any rate, these two things. So, so this, this, is, this is the foreshadowing about Elijah. This is the foreshadowing about Moses. And now here they are. Some people say, well, Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And, and here they are right here with Jesus. <clears throat> now... You can count on Peter to speak up. You know, he's the kind of guy that you really like having a Bible class like this one because when you ask questions and people are exhausted and zoned out, then Peter's always going to speak up and say something. It may not be the right thing, but he'll speak up, okay? So, anyway, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. <clears throat> What's, what's Peter's vision of what's going to happen here? What's Peter's vision? What does this sound like? Are they going to have a camp out? I mean, what's going to happen? Jason, what's his vision of what's going to happen next? What, what do you think this is going to be like? It sounds like this is a starting point, and they're going to rest or whatever, and then all three are going to proceed. At any rate, it, it sounds like Peter's thinking they may just stay here for a while. He says, it is good for us to be here. So, let's kind of move in. You know, let's kind of get comfortable here. Let's, Because I'm sure that a lot of people would like to hike up this mountain to see Elijah and Moses. And if they see Elijah and Moses talking with you, Jesus, they'll get the right idea about how great you really are. and who you. So, let's just kind of set up a... Uh, a tourist stop here. How about that? You know? Wouldn't that be great? I think it was more than that. Uh, so how, how would just regular people have known this was Elijah Moses? 
children. Prob there was conversation going on between Jesus and them, and probably there was conversation. That's what I You know, thinking. when I was little, there's a picture of this in my Bible, and underneath Elijah it said Elijah, and then underneath Moses it said Moses. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus had on a white dress, you know, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. At any rate, but Jason, you were saying it's more than that. So so you, you're going to elaborate yeah. on that a little bit? I think James said it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you said that. Excuse me, with the mask on and my hearing aids, you know, I'm there, so maybe back here. I don't know. So, what were you going to say, James? There were there. I think there was a, a, a spiritual significance in the word Peter was using. He's basically want to raise a a special place, referencing the concept of the tabernacle in in the wilderness the place of divine intervention he's almost equating Moses and Elijah with Jesus yeah. okay so, so this is a really important point yeah. you know in Peter's mind this is this is about as much honor this is about as much honor as, as you can confer on anyone to say that they're on the same plane as Moses and Elijah. To say that, you know, a certain president is the equal of Washington and Lincoln. I mean, there are pictures on a dollar bill, you know, what five dollar bill and one dollar. I mean, how can you get better than that? You know? That's the ultimate compliment. But instead, a cloud, a cloud comes over the mountain, which is kind of a an echo of Sinai when God gave the law at Sinai. Heaven is responding to, to, to Peter's desire of the equating. Exactly, exactly. So the voice from heaven says, this, this is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to, not them, but listen to him, to him. And so what we see here is the voice from heaven speaking. Yeah, you know, Moses and Elijah, they're, they're good guys, okay? But, but the sun is way up here. You know, uh, Moses, it's, it's a great title. God always refers to him as Moses, my servant. Opening the book of Joshua, God speaking to Joshua, he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. He's gone on top of the mountain. He ain't coming back. So Joshua, now you're in charge. Moses, my servant. We'll say everybody's a servant of God. Well, maybe so, but God calls Moses his servant. But here he calls Jesus his son. So he's saying he's, he's way up high above these, these other folks. <clears throat> that is, I think there's something going on here psychologically that it seems that everybody does at every age, and we do it too. When something new comes along, fundamentally new, we don't recognize the fundamental importance of it. We just try to fit it into it our system of thinking. The Jewish leaders were doing that with Jesus. The apostles weren't getting it. They wanted to see him as a prophet and so forth. The book of Hebrews starts out with his ultimate supremacy and uniqueness even above angels. And so that point has to be made hard because <laughs> everybody just wants to pull it down and fit it into their thinking on some level. We've got to be careful we don't read the Bible that way. Yeah, it, it's so important. I think this is the point that's made perhaps in the parable about the old wine and the new wine skins. And uh, it, it's, the, it's the whole idea of a, of a new paradigm. And so I think that's part of the, part of the message here is that, that Jesus is a totally new paradigm. But the moral of the story is, <clears throat> there, there are a couple of morals here. And first of all, th this is the word right here. Listen, listen to and, uh, you know, as I get older, I'm often impressed with people that have really good listening skills. Abigail, when you go to your dad and want to buy a car, because he doesn't sell cars anymore, yeah. you don't tell him six times that, look, I want a white car. You just mentioned kind of offhand, I want to have a white car. He knows that. He picks it. His listening skills are superb when it comes to selling cars. Now, maybe when you're telling him why you want to get together on Thanksgiving or something, he's not listening, but... If you're buying a car, he's listening, okay? He's listening. Great listening skills. So this is something that we have to cultivate in our spiritual life to listen to him, okay? 
So at any rate, <clears throat> the disciples heard this. They fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. The role of human touch there. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one but Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, now notice this. Peter says it's good for us to be here. Let's stay up here on top of this mountain. Isn't this inspiring? And we talk about the mountaintop experience. And the thing about our mountaintop experiences is they are usually followed by valleys. They're usually followed by valleys. That's the, that's the topography of life, okay? And that's what's about to happen here. On the way down the mountain, Jesus said, don't tell anybody. What's with Jesus? You know, he, 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 told, them, he told them in the previous chapter, uh, uh, verse 20, chapter 16, glance back there. He warned, he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ, okay? Then he says, don't tell anybody what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the... What's all this secrecy business? What do you think about that? Why, why is there so much secrecy? I sort of fit that into the general pattern of his not openly disclosing himself as the Son of Man, but only in cases that he does things like this leading up to this time. Um, in the struggle between him and the Jewish leaders, he's calling the shots. He's setting the timing, and he has the Passover for his target. He doesn't need a riot right now. So I think this is just sort of fits in that pattern. I might be wrong. No, I, I think that the, the issue of timing is exactly right, because when Jesus does open up, and they ask him straight out, are you the Messiah of the Son of the Blessed? He says, I am. Then he has hours to live at that point because right. they, they crucify him very quickly. And when he, he enters Jerusalem on that donkey, he's sticking his finger in their eye. And he's lighting the fire. Exactly. He's lighting a fire because there he is in the nation's capital and people are saying, this is the son of David. And they say the whole world has gone after him. We've got to do something right now. So... He's, he's trying to, as we would say, keep a lid on it so he has time to, again, using your word, Alvarenzo, to uh, disciple, to disciple these people. He needs time to do that. And so that's why he says, you know, don't tell anybody. Okay, so they're coming down the mountain. Then, as I say, they're followed, they fall into a valley, and that's the episode we read in verses 14 through 23. Verses 14 through 23. Would, would someone like to read that, or should I just call on you? Jason, thank you for volunteering. Would you read 17, 14 through 23? Can you do that? Yes. <clears throat> 17, 14 through 23. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. To 20. Yeah, 22 and 23 also, please. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and, when he, and he will be raised on the third day, and they will greatly distress. Okay. So, uh, they, they come down the mountain. And, and there's this, this crowd of people, and evidently there's some discussion and some argument, and at the center of the crowd is this father with this child. Now, if you've ever had a child with a serious illness, you feel this guy's desperation. And if you've had a child that you've taken to various doctors and various specialists, and they don't seem to be able to help any, you, you, you feel his, uh, his anguish and his desperation. Verse 16, I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And the diagnosis here is what? What's wrong with the kid? Seizures. Seizures. 
even today, you know, epileptic seizures or whether it's, seizures is mysterious. It's a mysterious thing. Your, neurology, neuroscience is, is kind of like the last frontier, the human brain. It's very complicated. Now, a little bit further on, we read that his, the root of the problem, the seizures is the symptom. The root of the problem is, is demon possession. So I have to kind of struggle with that a little bit. But at any rate, Jesus says something weird to me in verse 17. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring me the boy. Bring the boy here to me. Who is Jesus? Who, who is the unbelieving and perverse generation that he's, he's ranting about here? Who, who, who is it? Is it the father? Who is it? What's going on? Unbelieving and perverse generation. How long am I going to put up with you? Here we go again. We've done this before. What's... What, what's his problem? Who is he talking to? The disciples that couldn't, didn't have the faith to do the job. By a process of elimination, it is the disciples. Okay, so here's, here's a couple of themes that we see again. We've seen them before. We're going to see them again. So the, the first theme is failure of disciples. And this is a theme that we're going to see more and more. And that's faith. <laughs> if you do a word search with computer Bible on the expression little faith, you'll find that it appears five times in the book of Matthew. Every single time Jesus is talking about his disciples or talking to his disciples, okay? Not talking about agnostics, unbelievers, pagans, harlot, you know, he's not talking about those people. He's talking about disciples and he talks about little faith. Now, I've often said, often said, I've said some in this class that, you know, we can think about the Sermon on the Mount being the template or the umbrella or the charter for the book of Matthew. And so it's kind of the, the uh, outline and we can, as, as we, the themes that it introduces, we follow it through. The word faith, I don't think, appears in the Sermon on the Mount. Although there's some statements made about, you know, being obedient and that sort of thing that require faith. <coughs> It doesn't, really, it doesn't really open the door to the topic of faith. But it, it gets really big. It gets really big as we move through this book. Not as big as in, in the Gospel of John. You know, John's we saw the Gospel of Belief. But uh, the, the way that Jesus evaluated people was based on faith. If you had great faith, you were okay with him. And, and who, by the way, is rated as having great faith in the book of Matthew. Do you remember? Who has great faith? See some? Who has great faith in the book of Matthew? Centurion. Oh, centurion. Exactly right. The centurion, he served. And he said, you don't have to come to my house. Just say the word. It'll be okay. She said, I haven't found great faith like this anywhere in Israel. So it's a centurion who is a pagan, a Gentile, a non-Jew. And then there's one other person who's given the, the credit for having great faith. Do you remember the other person? Uh, the old man that, 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 uh, that woman, I think. Yes, exactly. The Canaanite woman, again, and she's approaching Jesus with a, a little child. And she says, you know, even the puppies, even the dogs get the crumbs. He says, you've got great faith. So it is interesting that, that Jesus really emphasizes this as a paramount quality, but the kind of faith that he talks about <clears throat> is not mental assent. Somehow we've gotten an idea that, that faith is mental assent. Instead, it is a faith that really impacts uh, behavior. Okay, so <clears throat> our, our use of the, of the word faith and the concept of faith is a little different than, uh, than Jesus. Uh, Okay, <clears throat> let's just uh, let's just talk about verses twenty-two and twenty-three. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, "The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life." The disciples were filled with grief. There are three official 
predictions by Jesus of his passion, of his death in the book of Matthew. This is number two. Remember in our opening segment today, uh, 16, 21 through 28, we ran into a prediction there in verse 21. So here he says it again. We also get kind of a prediction, if you're listening really carefully to what he says about John the Baptist, <clears throat> up in verse 12, I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. So really, this is the third time Jesus has said, I will be killed by the powerful people. I will be killed. So that's an important uh, foreshadowing and, and uh, holds with the idea that this whole section is Jesus uh, preparing to go to the, go to the cross. So we've used up our time here. The story about fishing for money, uh, maybe we can review that a little bit next time. Uh, interesting story about, the, about the, that particular coin, the drachma coin. We can talk about that a little bit next time. And then we'll move on into chapter 18, which is uh, one of Jesus' great speeches or discourses. And the only place in the book of Matthew where the word church appears, I think. So we'll, we'll be talking about that a little bit. Thank you so much for your attention and participation today.